アレックス・キッドのミラクルワールドアレックが繰り広げるスリルとサスペンスの大冒険Hello, everyone. I'm Tyler, and welcome to another episode of Player One Start. Today, we're going to talk about Alex Kidd for the Sega Master System. Sega wasn't much of a threat to Nintendo when it released its Master System in the mid 1980s. They had no market share, their advertising was almost non existent. However, those who had adopted the Master System would play with Sega's earliest franchises. One of these was Alex Kidd. The closest Sega came to having a Mario style mascot until Sonic the Hedgehog showed up years later. Alex Kidd was often compared to Mario since he was the only competitor at the time. Their games, however, couldn't be more different. While Mario is a straightforward platformer, Alex Kidd in Miracle World is a much more ambitious game. For starters, it breaks free from the repetitive four level cycle of Super Mario Bros. to create a more organic experience. Most levels scroll horizontally, however, a handful of levels also scroll vertically. And a few of the castle stages in the end actually scroll in all four directions. Throughout the adventure, you play through mountains, forests, oceans, towns, and other varied locations. A map at the beginning of each stage, and the pause screen shows your progress through the game's levels. So, few people here in North America actually realize that Alex Kidd predates Sonic the Hedgehog as Sega's first official mascot. And to tell you the truth, until I started collecting video games, I was completely unaware of this character's existence. Now, as far as I can tell, Alex Kidd was really supposed to be a mascot that was supposed to compete directly with Mario, but how close did they get on the gameplay? Let's go ahead and take a look. Alright, so first off, you're introduced to Alex Kidd and your two basic moves. You either have punch or jump. Every time Alex jumps, he makes a sound similar to Mario. It did take me a little bit to get used to the jumping, as you must get a little bit of momentum to be able to move in mid jump. In almost direct opposition to the first Super Mario Brothers, your goal is to move down the screen instead of across the screen. One thing I noticed right away is the expanded color palette that the Sega Master System has. This game definitely looks better than the first Super Mario Brothers. Otherwise, everything seems to be straightforward with the gameplay. Except for when I got to this part here. I thought I could attack this enemy, but it turns out I cannot. This is similar to the Poison Mushroom in Super Mario Bros. 2, at least the Japanese version, that greeted players, and I actually find this part very frustrating because you never know when this person's going to show up, and basically as soon as he does, he takes a life. Combine that with the fact that you only start out with a limited number of lives, I quickly died and had to restart the game from the beginning within this first level. However, this game does introduce you to what enemies can do to you in this first level, so this actually does not become an issue later in the game. Again, we are still in the first level, and this is another stark contrast to Super Mario Bros. Usually, when you transition between different environments in Super Mario Bros., you actually are changing different levels. But here we are in the same level, and now we have an entirely different level terrain, as well as different gameplay mechanics. And even the music changes, which I find this theme a bit more relaxing than the initial theme. But the gameplay remains no less challenging. Eventually, you reach the level exit, and it's on to the next stage. Yeah. 
Sometimes between the levels, you are given access to a bonus stage where you can get a chance to rack up some extra points and some extra cash. To be honest, I'm not quite sure if these reward sections are earned or if they're just predetermined. And here is where I encountered the first time I would have to enter into a Janken match, and I didn't know that was going to be an official name for Rock, Paper, Scissors. To tell you the truth, I actually found this to be the most disappointing part of the gameplay. I would really prefer some other way to encounter and fight the bosses, rather than just playing Rock, Paper, Scissors with them. But then again, I guess this is a unique way to proceed through the gameplay. Without giving you too many spoilers, just to let you know, you will be facing off against these enemies again. Upon completing the stage, it's off to the next level. Let's go ahead and take a look at me play through. At the end of this level is the first time I encountered a computer character that gives me some information on the story. You also notice there's a vehicle power-up that you can grab before you exit the stage. So this level changes the gameplay just a little bit more. Here you're given control of a bicycle helicopter, and your goal is to float through and collect as much money as you can while avoiding some of those red circle obstacles. If you do hit one of those circles, you'll actually lose your helicopter and be forced to play the water level below. I found it best to try not to be too gutsy with your moves on this, because you really don't want to lose that vehicle power-up, because the water level is a bit more difficult than actually just traveling through the air. It also took me a little bit to figure out that you can actually fire a weapon out to destroy enemies, and that was something that came in handy. And at the end of this level, I encountered the first boss. And I must say, Alex Kidd must be pretty strong if he can just punch a bull in the face several times for it to go down. Moving on to the next level, and we are in a cave that also has some lava pits. I must say, I'm actually not getting bored of this game, partially because of the varied terrains that it has. And each terrain kind of has its own little obstacle and gameplay element that you must master in order to proceed.
this off to the next level. Let's go ahead and take a look at me play through it. Well, after mastering some of the early platforming stages, you are now in a completely different area known as, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, the Redaxian Castle. I gotta tell you, I actually did find this area to be the most challenging because now you have to go in all four directions. You can actually get lost in this. It becomes a lot more open than a lot of other levels where it's just linear, get here, start to finish. Your goal in this castle is to actually free someone who has been kidnapped by the bad guy in this game. Now, this is not the final level, however, this is as far as I'm going to take you, partially so that you'll have the opportunity to play this game yourself, but also because the gameplay elements after this level are mostly more of the same, but at a higher difficulty level. So what are my thoughts on Alex Kidd in Miracle World? Well, to start, my first experience with Alex Kidd was with Alex Kidd in High Tech World. And I have to tell you, if that had been my only experience with the Alex Kidd franchise, I would say it's definitely one to skip and it's complete and utter garbage. But this game actually makes up for all of that. And since Alex Kidd in Miracle World came out before that game, I kind of have to reset my opinion to match the chronology of the series. So had this been the first game I played, I would definitely recommend it. This game is actually fun challenging and enjoyable even still to this day. I really feel like this game shows off the expanded color palette of the Sega Master System that really can't be done on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The gameplay, while fun, addicting, and challenging, is not necessarily the same as Super Mario Brothers. But is that really a problem? In my opinion, I don't think so. Even though they were meant to directly compete with each other, I really feel like these games aren't as comparable. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that there was no such thing as a platformer. These were just called video games back in the day. So there wasn't really a standard formula for making platform games at this time. That actually works out to this game's advantage. The biggest, if not only, complaint I have about this game is that every time you shut the game off, you have to start back all the way at the beginning. But this issue plagues a lot of platformers in the 1980s due to the fact that cartridges didn't really have a standard way to save a game along the way. So would I recommend this to modern gamers? today. I would say if you're going to start playing games on the Master System, this one is a must play. I think it's part of an essential collection you should have on here. And I want to thank everyone on Twitter who helped point me in the direction of this game. I was very skeptical of going back to the Alex Kidd franchise, keeping in mind that my only experience had been Alex Kidd in High Tech World. Now, I don't think that game itself is necessarily terrible, but I do plan to explain my opinion on that game a bit more in a future episode. Well, that'll about wrap it up for this video. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like and subscribe button, share with a friend. I want to thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I'll see you guys next time. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you'd like to see some of the content I've already done, feel free to click on some of the suggestions that are popping up on your screen. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.